So I'm going to talk today about something I don't think I've really discussed before, which is um, uh, my journey to deep learning. So nowadays I am all deep learning all the time. And uh, a lot of people seem to kind of assume that anybody who's doing deep learning kind of jumps straight into it without looking at anything else. Um, but actually, at least for me, um, it was a many decade journey to this point. And um, um, it's because I've done so many other things and seen um, how much easier my life is with deep learning that I've become uh, such an evangelist for this technology. Um, so I, um, I actually started out my career at McKinsey and Company, which is a management consulting firm. And um, quite unusually, I started there when I was 18. Um, and uh, that was a challenge because um, in strategy consulting, um, people are generally really leveraging their, their expertise and experience. And of course, I didn't have either of those things. Um, so I really had to rely on data analysis uh, right from the start. And um, what, so what happened was I, I, you know, from the very start of my career, I was really relying very heavily on, on, on applied data analysis to answer real world questions. And so in a consulting context, you don't have that much time and you're talking to people who really have a lot of domain expertise and you have to be able to um, communicate in a way that actually matters to them. Um, and <clears throat> I used a variety of techniques in my data analysis. Um, one of my favorite things to use was this was um, just before kind of pivot tables appeared and when they appeared that was like something I used a lot, um, used various kind of um, database tools and so forth, but I did actually use machine learning uh, quite a bit um, and uh, had a lot of success with that. Um, most of the machine learning that I was doing was based on kind of logistic or linear regression or something like that. and um, Rather than show you something I did back then, because I can't, because it was all um, uh, proprietary, um, let me give you an example uh, from um, the computational pathologist paper uh, uh, from uh, Andy Beck and Daphne Collar and others at Stanford. Um, this was, I'm trying to think, maybe 2011 or something like that, uh, or 2012. And they developed a five-year survival model um, for breast cancer, I believe it was. And the inputs to their five-year survival model were um, uh, histopathology slices, uh, stained slides. Um, and um, they built a five-year survival predictive model that was very significantly better than anything that had come before. And um, what they described in their in their paper is the way they went about it was um, what I would call call nowadays kind of classic machine learning. Um, they used a, um, a regularized logistic regression, uh, and they fed into that logistic regression, um, if I remember correctly, thousands I think of um, features. And the features they built were built by a large expert team of pathologists, computer scientists, mathematicians, and so forth, that work together to, to think about what kinds of features might be interesting and how do we encode them. So that things like relationships of contiguous epithelial regions with underlying nuclear objects, or characteristics of epithelial nuclei and epithelial cyt cytoplasm, characteristics of stromal nuclei and stromal matrix, and so on and so forth. So it took um, many people, many years, um, to to create these features and come up with them and implement them and test them, and then um, the actual modeling process was fairly straightforward. Um, they took images from um, patients that stayed alive for five years, and they took images from those that didn't, and then used a fairly standard logistic reg regularized logistic regression um, to build a 
classifiers, so basically to create parameters around these different features. Um, and to be clear, um, this approach um, worked well for this particular case and, and, and worked well for me for years, um, for, for many, many projects. Um, and it's, it's kind of a, it's a perfectly reasonable bread and butter technique um, that you can certainly still use today um, in a very similar way. Um, I, you know, spent a lot of time um, studying how to get the most out of this. Um, one nice trick that a lot of people are not as familiar with as they should be um, is what do you do with um, uh, continuous inputs in these cases and how do you um, transform them so that you can handle nonlinearities. A lot of people uh, use polynomials for that. And actually polynomials are generally a terrible choice. Um, nearly always the best choice, it turns out, is actually to use something called natural cubic splines. Um, and natural cubic splines are basically where you split your um, data set into, into kind of um, um, sections of the domain um, and you connect each section up with a cubic, so each of these bits between dots are cubics, and um, you create the bases such that these cubics um, connect up with each other uh, and their gradients connect up. And one of the interesting things that makes them natural splines is that uh, the endpoints are actually linear um, rather than cubic, which actually makes these um, extrapolate outside the input domain really nicely. Um, uh, you can see as you add more and more knots, with just two knots, you start out with a line, and then as you add more knots, you start to get more and more opportunities for curves. Um, one of the cool things about natural splines, they're also called restricted cubic splines, is that actually you don't have to think at all about where to put um, the knot points. It turns out that there's basically a set of um, uh, quantiles where you can put the knot points um, pretty reliably, depending on how many knot points you want, which is independent of the data and nearly always works. So this was a nice trick. Um, and then, you know, another nice trick is if you do use uh, regularized regression, particularly L1 regularized regression, I really like, um, you don't even have to be that careful about the number of parameters you include a lot of the time. So you can often include quite a lot of transformations, um, including actually, uh, sorry, not transformations, uh, interactions, um, including interactions of um, um, natural cubic spline terms. So, uh, you know, this is an approach that I used um, a lot and had a lot of success with. Um, but then um, in the, I think it was 99 that the first um, paper appeared in the early, in kind of 2000, started getting popular, was um, Random Forests. And random forests, um, this is a, a picture from uh, Terence Parr's excellent D-tree viz um, package. Random forests are um, ensembles of decision trees, as I'm sure most of you know. And so, for an example of a, dec of a decision tree, uh, this is some uh, data from the Kaggle um, uh, competition, which is trying to predict the auction price of heavy industrial equipment. and um, uh, you can see here that a decision tree has uh, done a split on this binary variable of coupler system, and then for those which I guess don't have a coupler system, it did a binary split on year made, and those which then were made in early years, then split. Uh, oh, I, then we can see immediately the sale price. So this is the thing we're trying to predict the sale price, and so in this case, um, we can see that it's uh, in just four splits, it successfully um, found some things which, this is actually the log of sale price, has done a really good job of splitting out the log of sale price. Um, I actually used these, you know, single decision trees a, a little bit in the um, kind of early and mid 90s, but they were um, a nightmare to find something that, that fit adequately but didn't overfit. And random forests then came along thanks to um, uh, Bryman, who, a very interesting guy, he was originally a math professor at Berkeley, and then he went out into industry and was basically a consultant, I think, for years, and then came back to Berkeley to do 
statistics. And uh, he was incredibly um, effective in creating like really practical algorithms. And the random forest is one that's really been world changing. Incredibly simple. You just um, randomly pick a subset of your data um, and you then train a model, train a, you know, just create a decision tree uh, with a subset. Uh, you save it and then you repeat steps one, two, and three again and again and again, creating lots and lots of decision trees on different random subsets of the data. And it turns out that if you average uh, the results of all these models, um, you get um, uh, predictions that are um, unbiased, um, accurate, um, and uh, don't overfit. Um, and it's a really, really cool approach. Um, so it's basically as soon as this came out, I added it to my arsenal. One of the really nice things about this is how quickly you can implement it. Um, we implemented it in like a day, basically. Um, so this came out when um, I was running a company called Optimal Decisions, which I built to um, help insurers uh, come up with better prices, which is the most important thing for insurers to do. Um, one of the interesting things about this for me is that we never actually deployed a random forest. Um, what we did was we used random forests to understand the data, and then we used that understanding of the data to then go back and basically build more traditional regression models with the particular um, terms and transformations and interactions that the random forest found were important. So basically, this is one of the cool things that you get out of a random forest. It's a um, feature importance plot. And um, it, it shows you, so this is again from the same data set, the auction price data set from Kaggle. It shows you which um, are the most important features. And the nice thing about this is you don't have to do any transformations or think about interactions or nonlinearities um, because they're using decision trees behind the scenes. It all just works. And so, so I kind of developed this pretty um, simple approach where I would first create a random forest, and I would then find which features and so forth are useful. I'd then use partial um, dependence plots to kind of look at the shapes of them. And then I'd go back and kind of, for the continuous variables that matter, create the cubic splines and um, um, create the interactions and then do, you know, a regression. And so this basic kind of trick was um, incredibly powerful. And I used it um, variants of it um, in the early days of Kaggle, um, amongst other things, and um, got to number one in the world um, and uh, won a number of competitions. And funnily enough, actually, back in 2011, I described um, my approaches to Kaggle competitions um, in Melbourne um, at the Melbourne um, R Meetup. And uh, you can still find that talk on, on YouTube. And it's actually still pretty much just as relevant today as it was um, at that time. Um, so this is 2011, um, and uh, I became the um, chief scientist and president at Kaggle, um, and um, we took it over to the US and um, got venture capital and built into um, quite a successful business. Um, but something interesting that happened um, as chief scientist of Kaggle, you know, I was, I was getting to see all the competitions up close. And um, seven years ago, there was a competition, um, Dogs versus Cats, which um, you can still see actually on the Dogs versus Cats Kaggle page. It describes the state of the art approach for recognizing dogs versus cats as being around about 80% accuracy. Um, and uh, so that was based on the, the academic papers that had tackled this problem at the time. And then uh, in this competition that just ran for three months, um, eight teams reached 98% accuracy, and one nearly got to 99% accuracy. So if you think about this as a 20% error rate, and this is basically a 1% error rate, so this competition brought the state of the art down by about 20 times in three months, which is um, really extraordinary. It's really unheard of to see an academic state-of-the-art result that has been you know, carefully studied, slashed by 20x, 
by somebody working for just three months on the problem. Um, you know, that's normally something that might take decades or hundreds of years, if it's possible at all. Um, so something clearly happened here. And of course, what happened was, um, was deep learning. Um, and uh, Pierre actually had developed one of the early deep learning libraries. And, and actually, um, even this kind of signal on Kaggle was in some ways a little late. If you actually look at Pierre's um, uh, Google Scholar, you'll see that it was actually back in 2011 that him and Jan LeCun had uh, already produced a system uh, that was better than human performance at recognizing traffic signs. Um, and so this was actually the first time that I noticed uh, this, this um, really extraordinary thing, which was um, our, you know, deep learning being better at than humans at very human tasks, um, like, you know, looking at pictures. Um, and so, you know, in, in, in 2011, I thought, wow, that's, that's super interesting, but it's hard to do anything with that information because there wasn't any open source software or even any commercial software available to actually do it. it there was, um, um, Jürgen Schmidhuber's lab had a kind of like a DLL or something or a library you could buy from them to do it. Um, although they didn't even have a demo. Um, you know, there wasn't any online services and there wasn't any, nobody had published anywhere like the actual recipe book of like, how the hell do you do these things? Um, and so that was, that was a huge challenge. Uh, it's like, it's exciting to see that this is possible, but then it's like, well, what do I do about it? But, but, but one of the cool things is that at this exact moment, this dogs and cats moment is when, um, two um, really accessible open source libraries appeared, um, allowing people to actually create um, their own deep learning models for the first time. Um, and critically, they, they were built on top of CUDA, which was a, a you know dramatically more convenient way of programming GPUs than had previously existed. So kind of things started to come together, um, you know, really seven years ago. Um, a, a little bit. Um, I had been interested in neural networks um, since since the very start of my career. And in fact, um, uh, in consulting, um, I worked with one of the big Australian banks on implementing a neural network uh, in the early to mid 90s um, to help with targeted marketing. Not a very exciting application, I'll give you. Um, but it, it was, it really struck me at the time that this was a technology which I felt like at some point would probably take over just about everything else in terms of my area of interest around predictive modeling. Um, and we actually had quite a bit of success with it even then. Um, so that's, um, you know, like 30 years ago now, um, nearly. Um, but, the, you know, there were some issues back then. For one thing, we had to buy custom hardware that cost millions of dollars. Um, we really needed a lot of data, um, millions of data points. So, you know, in a retail bank, we could do that. Um, and, yeah, it was, even then, there were things that just weren't quite working as well as we would expect. Um, and so, as it turned out, the key problem was that back then, everybody was relying on this um, this math result called the Universal Approximation Theorem, which said that a neural network could solve any given problem, computable problem, to, to any arbitrary level of accuracy, um, and it only needs one hidden layer. Um, and, you know, this is one of the many, many times in deep learning history where theory has been um, used in totally inappropriate ways. Um, and the problem with this theory was that although this was theoretically true, um, in practice, a neural network with one hidden layer requires far too many nodes to be useful most of the time. And what we actually need is lots of hidden layers, and that turns out to be much more um, efficient. Um, so 
anyway, I, I did kind of feel like for those 20 years, at some point, neural networks are going to reappear in my life um, because of this like infinitely flexible function. You know, the fact that they can they can solve any given problem in theory. Um, and then, you know, along with this infinitely flexible function, we combine it with gradient descent, which is this um, all-purpose parameter fitting algorithm. And again, there was a problem with theory here, which is I spent many, many years focused on operations research and uh, optimization. And um, operations research generally focused on, again, kind of theoretical questions of what is provably able to find the definite maximum or minimum of a function. And um, gradient descent doesn't do that, um, um, particularly stochastic gradient descent. Um, and so a lot of people were kind of ignoring it. Um, but the thing is, the question we should be asking is not what can we prove, but what actually works in practice. And the people who, the, the, the very small number of people who were, were working on neural networks and gradient descent uh, throughout the 90s and early 2000s, despite, you know, the, all the theory that said it's a terrible idea, um, actually were finding it, it was working really well. Um, unfortunately, you know, academia um, around machine learning has tended to be much more driven by theory than results, or at least for a long time it was. I still think it is too much. Um, and so the fact that there were there were people like Hinton and Lacun saying, look, here's a model that's better than anything in the world at solving this problem, um, um, but you know, based on theory, we can't exactly prove why, but it but it like really works. Those were not getting published, um, unfortunately. Um, anyway, so things gradually began to, to change, and one of the big things that changed was that finally, um, in the you know kind of around 2014, 2015, we started to see some software appearing that allowed us to conveniently train these things on GPUs, which allowed us to um, use um, you know relatively inexpensive computers to actually get pretty good results. Um, so although the the theory didn't really change at this point. What did change is just more people could try things out and be like, oh, okay, this is actually practically really helpful. Um, to people outside of the world of neural networks, this all seemed very sudden. It seemed like there was this sudden fad around deep learning where people were suddenly going, wow, this is, this is amazing. And so people who had seen other fads quite reasonably thought, well, this one will pass too. Um, but the difference with this fad is it's actually been um, under development for many, many, many decades. So this was the first uh, neural network to be built, and it was back in 1957 that it was built. And um, continually, for all those decades, there were people working on making neural nets really work in practice. So what was happening in 2015 was not a sudden um, here's this new thing we're all going to flock to, but it was actually, here's this old thing which we finally got to the point where it's actually really working. Um, and so it's, it's, it's not a new fad at all, but it's really the result of decades of hard work of, of solving lots of problems and finally getting to a point where things are, are making sense. Um, but what ha has happened since kind of 2015 is the ability of these um, uh, infinitely flexible functions has suddenly started to become clear even to a layperson because you can just look at what they're doing and it's mind-blowing. So for example, if you look at OpenAI's um, DALI, um, this is a model that's been trained on pairs of pictures and um, captions such that you can now write any arbitrary sentence. So if you write a, if you write an illustration of a baby daikon radish in a tutu walking a dog, Dali will draw pictures of what you described for you. And here are some actual non-cherry-picked pictures of that. And so to be clear, this is all out of domain. 
Right? So Dali has never seen illustrations of baby daikon radishes yet, or radishes and tutus, or let alone any of this combination of things. It's um, it's creating these entirely from scratch. Um, by the same token, it's never seen an avocado-shaped chair before, as best as I know. But if you type in an armchair in the shape of an avocado, it it creates these um, pictures for you from scratch. And so, you know, it's 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 really cool now that we can actually kind of show. We can actually say, look what computers can do, um, and look what computers can do if you use deep learning and to you know anybody who's grown up in the kind of pre deep learning era, this just looks like magic. You know, it's like this is not things that I believe <laughs> computers can do, um, but but here we are. This is this is the this uh, um, theoretically universal um, um, universally capable model actually doing things that we've trained it to do. Um, so in the last few years, we're now starting to see you know, many times every year examples of computers doing things which we're being told computers won't be able to do in our lifetime. So for example, I was repeatedly told by experts that in my lifetime we would never see a computer win a game of Go against an expert. And of course we're now at the point where AlphaGo Zero got to that point in three days, and it's so far ahead of the best expert now that you know, it's it's kind of makes the world's best experts look like um, total beginners. And one of the really interesting things about um, AlphaGo Zero is that if you actually look at the source code for it, um, here it is. And the source code for, for the key thing, which is like the thing that figures out whether a Go board's a good position or not, um, fits on um, one, one slide. And furthermore, if you've done any deep learning, you'll recognize it as looking almost exactly like a standard um, computer vision model. Um, and so um, one of the things which people who are not themselves deep learning practitioners don't quite realize is that deep learning on the whole is not a huge collection of somewhat disconnected but slightly connected kind of tricks. It's actually you know, every deep learning model I build looks almost exactly like every other model I build with fairly minor differences. And I train them in nearly exactly the same way with fairly minor differences. Um, and so deep learning has become this um, incredibly flexible skill that if you have it, you can turn your attention to lots of different domain areas and, and rapidly get incredibly good results. So at this point, deep learning is now the best approach in the world for all kinds of applications. Okay. Now, I'm not going to read them all, and this is by no means a complete list. It's, it's far longer than this, but these are some examples of the kinds of things that deep learning is, is better at than any other known approach. Um, so why am I spending so much time in my life now on deep learning? Um, because it really feels to me like a very dramatic step change in human capability, um, like the development of electricity, for example. And you know, I would like to think that when I see a very dramatic step change in human capability, I'm going to spend my time working on um, figuring out how best to take advantage of that capability, um, because that's you know, there's going to be so many world-changing breakthroughs that come out of that. And particularly as somebody who's um, built a few companies, um, as an entrepreneur, the, the number one thing for an entrepreneur to find and that investors look for is, is there something you can build now that people couldn't build before in terms of as a company? And with deep learning, the answer to that is yes, across tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of, of, of areas. Because it's like, okay, suddenly there's tools which we couldn't automate before and now we can, or we can make hundreds of times more productive, or so forth. So it's to me it's a very obvious thing that like this is what I want to spend all my time on. And when I talk to students, I'm, uh, you know, uh, or 
um, interested entrepreneurs, I always say, you know, this is the thing which is making lots and lots of people extremely rich um, and is solving lots and lots of important societal problems. Um, and we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg. So as soon as I got to the point that I, I realized this, um, I, just, I decided to start a company to, to actually, you know, do, do something important. And so I got very excited about the opportunities in medicine. And I created the first deep learning and medicine company called um, Inletic. And um, I didn't know anything about medicine and I didn't know any people in medicine. So I kind of like got together a group of um, um, three other people and me. And uh, we decided to kind of hack together a, um, a, a quick deep learning model that would see if we can predict the malignancy of um, nodules in lung CT scans. And um, it turned out that we could. Um, and in fact, the algorithm that we built for this company that, that I ended up calling Analytic had, had a better false positive rate and a better false negative rate than actually a panel of four trained radiologists. And so this was at a time when um, deep learning in medicine uh, and uh, deep learning in radiology was, was unheard of. Um, there were basically no papers about it. There were certainly no startups about it. Um, no one was talking about it. And so this, uh, this finding got some attention. And this was really important to me because my biggest goal with Analytic was to kind of get deep learning and medicine on the map because I felt like it could save a lot of lives. Um, so I wanted to get a lot of, as much attention around this as possible. And, um, yeah, very quickly, um, lots and lots of people were writing about this new company. And as a result, um, very quickly, deep learning, particularly in radiology, took off. And within um, two years, um, the main radiology conference had a huge um, stream around AI. It was lines out the door. Uh, they created a new, um, a whole new journal for it, um, and so forth. And so that was really exciting for me to see um, how, you know, we could help kind of put a technology on the map. Um, um, in some ways, you know, so this is great, but in some ways it was kind of disappointing because there were so many other areas where deep learning should have been on the map, and it wasn't. And um, there's no way that I could create you know, companies around every possible area. So instead I thought, well, what I want to do is make it easy for other people to create to create companies and products and solutions using deep learning. Um, particularly because at that time, nearly everybody I knew in the deep learning world were, were, were um, young white men from one of a small number of exclusive universities. Um, and um, the problem with that is that there's a lot of societally important problems to solve which that group of people just weren't familiar with. Um, and even if they were both familiar with them and interested with them, interested in them, they would they didn't know how to find the data for those or you know what the kind of constraints and implementation are and so forth. So um, Dr. Rachel Thomas and I decided to create a, a new organization, that would focus on one thing, which was making deep learning accessible. And so basically the idea was to say, okay, if this really is a step change in human capability, which happens from time to time in, in, in technology history, um, what can we do to help um, people use this technology regardless of their background? And so there was a lot of constraints that we had to, to help remove. Um, so the first thing we did was we thought, okay, let's at least make it so that um, what people already know about how to build deep learning models is, um, is as available as possible. So at this time, there weren't any courses or any kind of easy ways in to get going with deep learning. And we had a theory, which was we thought you don't need a Stanford PhD to be an effective deep learning practitioner. You don't need um, years and years of graduate level math training. We thought that we might be able to build a course 
that would allow people with just a year of coding background to become effective deep learning practitioners. Now at this time, so what is this, about 2014 or 2015, can't quite remember, maybe 2015, um, nothing like this existed and this was a really controversial hypothesis. And to be clear, we weren't sure we were right, um, but we this was, this was a feeling we had. So we thought, let's give it a go. So the first thing we created was um, a fast AI practical deep learning course. And um, certainly one thing we immediately saw, which was thrilling, and we certainly didn't know what would, would happen, was that it was popular. Um, a lot of people took the course. Um, we made it freely available online with no ads, to make it you know as, as accessible as possible, since that's our mission. And I said to the um, that first class, um, if you create something interesting with deep learning, um, please tell us about it on our forums. So we created a forum so that so that students could communicate with each other, and um, we got thousands of replies. And um, I remember one of the first ones we got. I think was was this was one of the first was um, somebody who tried to recognize cricket pictures from baseball pictures. And uh, they had, um, I think it was like 100% accuracy or maybe 99% accuracy. And one of the really interesting things was that they only used 30 training images. Um, and so this is like exciting to us to see somebody like building a model and not only that, building it with far less data than people used to think was, was necessary. And then suddenly we were being flooded with all these cool um, models people were building. So um, uh, a uh, Trinidad and Tobago, to different types of people model, a, a zucchini and cucumber model. Uh, this is a really interesting one. This person actually managed to predict um, what part of the world a satellite photo was from with over 110 classes with 85% accuracy, which is extraordinary. Um, a Panama bus recognizer, a batik cloth recognizer. Uh, um, you know, this. You know, some of the things were clearly actually going to be very useful in practice. This was something useful for disaster resilience, which was recognizing um, the state of, of buildings uh, in this place in Tanzania. Um, we saw people even, um, you know, right at the start of the course, breaking state-of-the-art results. Uh, so um, I think this is on Devangari. Um, character recognition. Um, this person said, wow, I just got a new state-of-the-art result, which was really exciting. Um, we saw people doing the same, similar getting um, state-of-the-art results on um, audio classification. Um, and then um, even we started to hear from some of these students in the first year that they were taking their ideas back to their companies. And um, in this case, um, a software engineer um, went back to his company, he was working at Splunk, and um, built a new model which basically took mouse movements and mouse clicks and turned them into pictures, and then classified them, um, and used this to help with fraud. Um, and um, we know about this because it was so successful that it ended up being a patented um, product, and uh, Splunk created a, a, a blog about the, this cool new technology that was built by, you know, um, a software engineer with no previous background in this area. And we saw startups appearing. So for example, this startup called Envision appeared um, from one of our students um, and uh, it's still going strong. I just looked it up before, before this. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was really cool to see how um, people from all walks of life were actually able to get started with, with deep learning. Um, and um, you know, these courses got really popular and so we started redoing them every year. So we'd build a new course from scratch because things were moving so fast that within a year there was so much new, new stuff to cover that we'd build a completely new course. And so uh, there's, you know, many millions of views at this point and, um, you know, people are loving them based on what they're telling YouTube anyway. Um, so this has been... Um, really a pleasure to see. Um, we ended up turning the course into a book as well, along with my friend Sylvain Gougeur, and uh, people are really liking the book as well. Um, so after, the next step after kind of 
getting people started with what do we already know by, by turning, putting that into a course is we wanted to push the boundaries beyond what we already know. And so one of the things that came up was uh, a lot of students or potential students were saying, I don't think it's worth me getting involved in deep learning because it takes too much compute and too much data and it's, you know, uh, unless you're Google or Facebook, you can't do it. And this became particularly an issue when Google released their TPUs and put out a big PR exercise saying, okay, you know, TPUs are so great that nobody else, you know, can pretty much do anything useful in, in deep learning now. Um, and so we decided to enter this international um, competition called Dawnbench that Google and Intel had entered um, to see if we could beat them, like be faster than them at training deep learning models. And uh, so that was April 2018, and uh, we we won on uh, many of the um, axes of, of the competition. Um, uh, the cheapest, the fastest GPU, fastest single machine, um, and then we followed this up with additional results that were actually 40% faster than Google's best GPU results. And so this was um, exciting because um, here's a picture of, of us and our students. Um, um, working on this project together. It's a really cool time. Um, you know, because it, it, we really wanted to push back against this narrative that you have to be Google. Um, and so it got a lot of um, media attention, which was great. Um, and it really, the, the finding here was using common sense is more important than using um, vast amounts of money and compute. Um, it was really cool to see also that a lot of the big companies noticed what we were doing and bought in our ideas. So, um, so uh, Nvidia, when they started promoting how great their GPUs were, um, they started talking about you know um, how good they were with the additional ideas that we had developed with our students. So, um, academic research became a critical component of fast AI's um, work. And we did similar research to um, drive breakthroughs in um, natural language processing, uh, in tabular modeling, and lots of other areas. So then the question is, okay, well, with all these, um, you know, now that we'd actually pushed the boundaries beyond what's already known, to say, okay, we, we can actually do, get better results with less data and less compute more quickly, how do we put that into the hands of of everybody so that everybody can use these insights. So that's why we decided to build um, a software library called FastAI. Um, so that was just in 2018 that version 1 came out, but it immediately got a lot of attention. It got supported by all the big um, cloud services. Um, and we were able to show that compared to Keras, for example, it was um, much more accurate, much faster, far, far less lines of code. Um, and uh, we um, really tried to make it as accessible as possible. So the, you know, this is uh, some of the documentation from FastAI. You can see that not only do you get the normal kind of API documentation, but it's actually, um, you know, got pictures of exactly what's going on. It's got links to the papers that it's implementing. And also all of the code for all of the pictures is all directly there as well. And one of the really nice things is that every single page of the documentation has a link to let you actually open that page of documentation as an interactive notebook, because the entire thing is built with interactive notebooks. So you can then get the exact same thing, but now you can experiment with it, and you can see all the source code there. Um, so we really took the kind of approaches that we found worked well in our course of having students do lots of experiments and lots of coding, um, and making that a kind of part of our documentation as well, is to let people really play play with everything themselves and experiment and see how it all works. Um, so incorporating all of this research into the software was super successful. Um, we started hearing from people saying, okay, well I've just started with FastAI and I've started pulling across some of my TensorFlow models and I don't understand why is everything so much better. Um, uh, you know, what's what's going on here? Um, so people were really noticing that um, 
they were getting dramatically better results. Um, so uh, this person um, said the same thing. Yep, we used to try to use TensorFlow. We spent months tweaking our model. We switched to fast AI, and within a couple of days, we were getting better results. So by kind of combining the, the research um, with the software, we were able to provide a software library that let people get started more quickly. Um, and then version two, um, which has been around for a bit over a year now, was a very dramatic advance further still. There's a whole academic paper that you can read describing um, the, all the deep design approaches which we've used. Um, one of the really nice things about it is that um, basically regardless of what you're trying to do with fast AI, you can use almost exactly the same code. So for example, um, here's the code necessary to recognize dogs from cats. Um, here's the code necessary to build a segmentation model. Um, it's, it's basically the same lines of code. Here's a code to um, uh, classify text movie reviews, almost the same lines of code. Uh, here's the code necessary to do collaborative filtering, almost the same lines of code. So I said earlier that kind of uh, un under the covers, you know, different models look more similar than different with deep learning. And so with fast AI, we've really tried to surface that so that you learn one API and you can use it um, anywhere. Um, that's not enough for researchers or people that really need to dig deeper. So one of the really nice things about that is that underneath this applications layer is a, is a tiered or a layered API where you can go in and change anything. Um, and I'm not going to describe it in too much detail, but for example, um, part of this um, mid-tier API is a new um, two-way callback system, um, which basically allows you at any point when you're training a model to see exactly what it's doing and to change literally anything that it's doing. You can skip parts of the training process, you can change the gradients, you can change the data, um, and so forth. Um, and so with this um, um, new approach, um, we're able to implement, for example, this is a, from a paper called MixUp, we're able to implement MixUp data augmentation in just a few lines of code. And if you compare that to the actual original Facebook paper, not only was it far more lines of code, uh, this, is, this is what it looks like from their research paper without using callbacks, but it's also far less flexible because it's, it's everything's hard-coded, or else with this approach, you can mix and match really easily. Um, another example of this layered API is we built a new approach to creating new optimizers um, using just two concepts, stats and steppers. And I won't go into the details, but in short, this is what a particular optimizer called Adam W looks like in PyTorch. Um, and uh, this took about two years between the paper being released and Facebook releasing the Adam W implementation. Um, our implementation was released within a day of the paper, and it consists of these one, two, three, four, five words. Um, uh, because we're leveraging this layered API for optimizers, it's basically really easy to, to um, utilize the components to quickly implement new papers. Um, here's another example of an optimizer. This one's called LAM. Uh, this came from a Google paper. And one of the really cool things you might notice is that uh, there's a very close match between the lines of code in, in, in our implementation and the lines of math in the algorithm in the paper. Um, so anyway, so there's you know, a, a little summary of, um, of both what uh, I'm doing now with fast AI and how I got there and why. And um, yeah, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Jeremy. So, um, yeah, really interesting kind of his historical view of, of where where you came from. And um, so, I guess, like you, so I'll start with a, a quick thing. So, I, you mentioned so, like in deep learning, that you know, obviously, there's very similar structures and code and, and solving problems. But are you? How do you incorporate things like knowledge about the problem? Like obviously, the the type of you know 
architecture that ha would have to go in there would come from the context of the problem? Right? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, there's there's a number of really interesting ways of incorporating knowledge about the problem, and it's it's a really important thing to to do because this is like this is the this is how you kind of get a whole lot of extra performance and uh, need less data and less time. Um, the more of that knowledge you can incorporate. So yeah, one way is certainly to directly implement it in the architecture. So for example, um, a very popular architecture for um, computer vision is uh, convolutional architecture. And the convolution, a 2D convolution, is taking advantage of our domain knowledge, which is that there's generally autocorrelation across pixels in both the X and Y dimensions. And so uh, we're basically mapping a, a set of weights across, you know, groups of pixels that are all next to each other. Um, there's a really wide range of interesting ways of incorporating all kinds of domain knowledge into architectures. Um, and, uh, you know, there's lots of um, geometry-based approaches of doing that. Um, within natural language processing, there's lots of autoregressive approaches there. Um, that's one area. Uh, an area I am extremely fond of is um, data augmentation. And in particular, there's been a huge um, kind of improvement in the last 12 months or so in um, how, how much we can do with a tiny amount of data by using something called um, self-supervised learning. And, uh, and in particular, using something called contrastive loss. And what this is doing is you basically come up with um, really th try to come up with really thoughtful data augmentation approaches where you can say like, okay, so for example, in NLP, um, one of the approaches is to translate each sentence with a translation model into a different language and then translate it back again. So you're now going to get a different version of the same sentence, but it should mean the same thing. And so then with contrastive loss, it basically says you add a part to the loss function that says those two different sentences should have the same result in our model. And so with um, something called UDA, which is basically an, uh, adding contrastive loss and self-supervised learning to NLP, they were able to get results for movie review classification with just 20 labeled examples that were better than the previous state of the art using 25,000 labeled examples. Um, anyway, there's lots of ways we can incorporate um, domain knowledge into models, but there's there's a couple of ones that I like. Uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, I guess there are a couple of questions about kind of interpretability. So one of the one of the questions that came up is it's hard to explain to stakeholders. And so how how can you kind of convince them that deep learning is worth adopting? I mean, obviously, the, you, you can show predictive performance, but is there any is there any other ways that you can, can do that? Sure. So my view is that deep learning models are much more interpretable and explainable than um, most regression models, um, for example. Uh, generally speaking, the traditional approach to people thinking the way the right way to understand, for example, regression models is to look at their coefficients. And I've always told people don't do that. Because in almost any real-world regression problem, you've got coefficients representing interactions, you've got coefficients on things that are collinear, you've got coefficients on various different bases of a, of a transformed nonlinear variable. None of the coefficients can be understood independently, because they can only be understood as how they combine with all the other things that are related. Um, so I... Um, genuinely really dislike it when people try and explain a regression by looking at coefficients. To me, the right way to understand a model is to um, do the same thing we would do to understand a person, which is to ask it questions. And so whether it's a regression or a random forest or a deep learning model, you can generally easily ask questions like, what would happen if I made this variable on this row a little bit bigger or a little bit smaller? Or, um, you know, things like that, which actually are much easier to do in deep learning, because in deep learning, those are just questions about the derivative of the input. And so you can actually get them much more quickly and easily. Um, you can also do really interesting things with deep learning around showing um, 
which things are similar to each other, kind of in the um, deep learning feature space. And you can build really cool um, applications for domain experts then, which can give them a lot of comfort. So you can say, yes, it's, it's accurate, but I can also show you which parts of the input are, you know, being are particularly important in this case, um, which other inputs are similar to this one. And often we find, like, for example, in the medical space, doctors will kind of go, wow, that's really clever the way it recognized that this patient and this patient were similar. A lot of doctors wouldn't have noticed that, but it's actually this subtle thing going on. And, and I guess we're, we're right at 11 o'clock, but maybe I'll, one last question that some uh, somebody brought up is, um, is there any uh, future research opportunities in the cross machine learning and quantum computing that you can think about? It's an interesting question. I don't know if you've thought um, about that. No, probably not when I've got any expertise on. Right, okay. It could well be an interesting question, but I'm yeah. not the right person to ask. Yeah. Okay. Um, one thing I do want to mention, and is um, I, I, I have just moved back to Australia after 10 years in um, San Francisco. Um, and I am extremely keen to see um, Australia become an, an absolute knowledge hub around deep learning. And I would particularly love to see, you know, our fast AI software like this, that, you know, just like when you think about TensorFlow, you kind of have this whole ecosystem around it, around Google and startups and all this. I would love to see like Australia become, uh, you know, that fast AI is kind of the, the homegrown library and that people here will really take it to heart and um, help us, help us make it brilliant. It's all open source, you know, and uh, we've got uh, a discord channel where we all chat about it and, you know, any organizations that are interested in, you know, uh, taking advantage of this of this free open source library, I would love to support them and see, like, you know, and academic institutions. I'd love to see this be become a really successful ecosystem here in Australia. Great. Yeah. No, it seems like there's uh, it's going to be quite useful to solve lots of problems. So I think it would be good to do. Um, so there are still some some questions in the chat. Uh, we'll we'll have the chat transcript, and if there's any questions that that Jeremy Feel might be worth addressing from there. We can we can think about posting uh, responses to those if there's anything in there. But we can do that after the fact. Um, so thank you everybody for coming and um, thank Jeremy for uh, joining us today. And thanks so um, much. Yeah, it's been great. Bye all.